Hello, everybody, and thank you all so much for spending 90 minutes with me today going over this talk. I've been doing this particular presentation or a version of it for about 15 years for primary care providers, specialists, uh, behavioral health, uh, lay public, uh, even a few times for um, legislators and so on and regulators. My background, just real briefly, is actually medical. I'm, I started training as an orthopedic surgeon um, mid-1980s and uh, couldn't do that actually because of my own back pain. So I, I switched to anesthesiology and then pain medicine with some additional training and a fellowship uh, that really brought me up to speed on neurology and rheumatology as well. So that was lucky. But I spent the last 20 years working in a multidisciplinary environment where I had psychologists, in particular health psychologists, working with me, uh, people that, that treated trauma, somatic experiencing, and so on. So we realized as we were treating, uh, we ran a pain clinic, primarily sports medicine and chronic pain, and we realized that primarily we were seeing people with um, who were suffering the adult effects of developmental trauma in the pain clinic when we were seeing people that were really struggling and not getting better, usually oftentimes on a lot of opioids and so on. And so that's where this talk comes from, is giving you our experience with peppered with evidence uh, as well. I'm gonna include quite a bit of, of research evidence as to the link between trauma and pain, for instance. Uh, and as I get started on this, I, I just like to set the tone, if I can, with some statistics from the CDC that you're probably familiar with. And that is in the mid-1990s, the CDC discovered an exposure that increases the risk for seven of the 10 leading causes of death in the United States. And those are medical causes. Those are stroke, diabetes, consequences, heart disease, lung disease, cancer, those sorts of things. And they, they found that at high doses, this exposure actually shortens lifespan by 20 years. And we find that it's pretty common as, as we can best estimate, the, this exposure probably affects about 30 million Americans. Now you would think that if there were something that is such a potent medical risk factor that we would be screening for it um, across our populations, kind of like we do for cancer and diabetes and so on, but that actually is not the case. And that's why I'm still giving this talk because um, part of my mission is to educate about the connection between trauma and, and pain and adult health in general. Uh, as a matter of fact, my colleagues and I actually feel that the opioid crisis came upon us, at least in part, because we weren't screening uh, in primary care, in pain clinics, in specialty clinics, and so on. We weren't screening for this exposure. Now, I'm calling it an exposure, but you can guess by the, by the title here that we're gonna be talking about trauma. In particular, the CDC was talking about developmental trauma, trauma under the age of 18 and toxic stress when they were talking about those statistics I just gave you. And we'll touch a little bit on adult trauma as well. I mentioned that the, um, that we, colleagues and I, believe that we have a better understanding of what has happened to us in the last 15, 10 to 15 years in the opioid crisis um, now as a consequence of the connection, understanding the connection between trauma, particularly developmental trauma and chronic pain. But let's just review that at the beginning. So I'm gonna wrap some of this, this presentation around the opioid crisis. It's still kind of inevitable to do that because so much of our discussion of chronic pain has really been directed at solving the opioid crisis. What was the opioid crisis? It was a crisis of accidental overdose on prescription medications. And it became particularly scary about a decade or so ago when we started seeing statistics showing that uh, kids in medical, middle school and high school were overdosing at parties on oxycodone, oxycontin pills and so on. So I wanted to know what, what, when we really got after the opioid crisis, just sort of a timeline. And it turns out it was about 2009, 2010. And here's evidence of that. This is from the Government Accounting Office, the Office of Accountability. And this is a presentation to Congress in 2010. 
And they're saying here, the highlighted part, that the DEA has used its increased funding to increase regulatory investigations of registrants, meaning people like me, people who are registered to prescribe scheduled substances. And as a result, they said, the number of regulatory investigations more than tripled between the fiscal years 2009 and 10. So I think, as far as I can tell, it's about 2010 that we really got after the opioid crisis. The question comes then, let's overlay that on this, on the graphs that the CDC has put out. And we actually do see in this graph that shows basically the amount of opioid prescribed for chronic pain uh, per, day, per day, per average, per American per day on average, starting to decrease in 2010. That's a very small dip, but that's an unmistakable inflection point right there in 2010 after the DEA started increasing its investigations of registrants. You would have thought it was more, but it was just a slight dip. But this is a familiar graph to many of us. Look what happens when we overlay a line in 2010. This green line here is um, portraying the overdose, overdose deaths involving any opioid, which includes heroin, includes street drugs, it includes prescription medication. And it starts to just take off after 2010. But what's more is the heroin overdose line takes off in 2010, right um, exactly at the time that we saw that GAO release. Uh, the fentanyl line takes off a few years later, I believe, when um, when the um, suppliers of illegal drugs realized that that was a very lucrative way to go. It looks like this purple dark line in the middle here kind of starts to taper off a little bit, doesn't really drop down. That is the number of overdose deaths in the United States as a consequence of prescription medications. So what this graph shows us is that we started to intervene in 2010, we know that, that we quickly got ourselves into a heroin and fentanyl crisis and we really didn't impact prescription opioid deaths. As a matter of fact, all opioid deaths really took off as a consequence of the, the shift apparently to illicit drugs, including fentanyl. Now, in the last few years, these curves have started to taper off. This curve up here has started to reach its peak as we're hearing with the uh, with, uh, COVID crisis, but it, it isn't coming down. The, we haven't gone back to pre-2010 levels in any stretch of the imagination. It, it, we've sort of leveled off at a high number of, of uh, accidental overdoses on all opioids, and it's not coming down. But I want to focus on what happened. In 2010, it sounds like we got after prescribers. We tried to limit the amount of opioid available, and it really backfired. That's what this graph shows me. So we must have missed something. And looking at the incidence of new addiction to prescription opioid, did we make any progress on that? So I was just showing you the, the statistics on accidental overdose deaths. How about new, new cases of addiction to prescription opioid? Nope, we didn't have any impact on that. So looking back from 2017, this is kind of the definitive analysis of the seven years following the 2010 uh, implementation of fighting the opioid crisis by reducing availability. This says long-term implementation of opioid dose and also risk reduction initiatives. They're throwing in the uh, naloxone and so on and opening uh, MAT clinics has not been associated with lower rates of prescription opioid use disorder among chronic opioid therapy patients. So these, this group of people who are receiving prescription drugs for, for chronic pain, uh, prescription opioid, there's been no change. So that isn't a very good report card, right? That's sort of the essence of it. You'd think we would have changed, but as of 2019, not so much. Uh, two years ago, the NIH lost an, launched a big, well-funded initiative to address pain, addiction, and opioid use disorder. <clears throat> the, really the same approach uh, is what this, what this tells us. After those statistics I just showed you, that kind of failure of the initial, um, the initial plan of limiting uh, people's access to opioid, we're still working on pain addiction and opioid use disorder, primarily looking at the opioid crisis as a crisis of addiction. Now, later on, I'm gonna 
propose to you that it is not a crisis of addiction uh, at its core and that there's something else that we missed. In order to get there, I have to go through uh, what is pain for you. And that's <clears throat> that's part of what I wanted to do anyway, is give you a more up-to-date of what are the things that can get our pain circuits in our brain spinning. So that would be a good definition of something that's painful. If you scan somebody's brain and the pain circuits are registering pain, well, that's real pain, regardless of how it comes about. So what are the things that we will perceive as pain? Get the pain circuits going. I'm going to talk to you about uh, through four, actually. This shows a timeline that I just totally made up <laughs> about nociceptive pain, um, neuropathic pain, and neuropathic pain from experiential nerve injury. That last one is something that we've only become to appreciate in the last decade or so. Maybe the last 15 years would be more accurate. But we've understood nociceptive pain forever. And let's talk about that. Let's start with what the most familiar type of pain is. About 30 years ago, this group, the International Association for the Study of Pain, IASP, they're the ones that put out definitions when it comes to uh, pain symptoms, kind of like the International Headache Society, or the DSM-5 is to mental health. They define pain as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with real or potential tissue damage, or described in terms of such damage. So they were linking pain to tissue damage. That is the essence of what nociceptive pain is. This is a drawing from 400 years ago that shows the nervous system actually, the spinal cord and so on, sensing too much heat in this fellow's foot. And that apparently is triggering a signal coming up here to the brain that reports potential or real tissue damage, in this case, the fire, too much heat. So we've known about that for a long time and drawn pictures of it. It's uh, even the Greek texts talk about it. I'm not going to I'm not going to hit you folks with too much of the the um, you know dense basic sciencey slides just a couple of them and this is one that shows an updated version of Rene Descartes slide showing the guy with the foot in the fire you me we all have sensors in our skin throughout our body that sense too much heat too much cold too much pressure and inflammation as a function of change in lowering pH. So we have four types of sensors that will sense tissue damage, and that makes sense. We wanna know if there's too much pressure or if something is burning us or freezing us or if there's inflammation. And the way this works is we have specialized nerves, these C and A delta fibers that are tied into these sensors. These little blobs here are those too much pressure, too much heat, cold, and inflammation sensors. If they fire, they trigger a signal in the peripheral nerve which gets processed in the spinal cord and then sent up to the brain, to two areas of pain processing in the brain, the somatosensory cortex and the emotional processor. The thalamus is sort of the switcher there. So that's kind of how this works. If, if you get cut or burned, it triggers these specialized sensors, sends a, a signal up to the spinal cord, just like a fire alarm would send a signal that there's smoke or too much heat in a room to the, the fire panel. And then that gets relayed to the brain and we, this person says, ouch, and, and can do something about it. Now this system is required to keep us alive. If this doesn't work, and there is a mutation, a very rare mutation in these peripheral nerves in particular, where they don't work. They're dedicated just to these sensors and they don't work. So people can't sense too much heat pain, too much pressure pain. Humans born with that condition, with that mutation, who can't feel pain generally have not survived into their teenage years. Recently, there's been some improvement in that because we just protect them, but you need this system to keep you alive. This is an example of the system just on paper. Nociceptors are what we call those sensors of too much heat, too much cold, too much pressure, and so on. They transduce something in the environment that could damage us or is damaging us. That triggers a signal in a peripheral nerve where it's transmitted to the spinal cord, where it's a very important part of the nervous system where that signal is modulated. It can be shut, shut off or amplified. And then eventually it gets up to the brain and we say, ouch, to the somatosensory cortex. So that is how it looks on paper. And I'm gonna use this diagram throughout describing what pain is when we talk about other types of pain. So I wanna set the foundation for what's going on here. There's a pain stimulus, trauma, inflammation, heat, and so on. 
our nervous system processes that, bundle all the peripheral nerves and spinal uh, cord and, and brain into just processing it and outcomes, pain and disability. We do something about it. We feel it, we move, that sort of thing. I mentioned that the, bra that the brain processes pain through the emotional processing centers as well. So it processes two ways. Sensory tells you what the stimulus is, where it is, and the emotional, which, which codes the unpleasantness, the emotional distress, uh, the miserableness of pain. When someone says, I'm miserable in pain or I'm crying in pain, they're telling you that the emotional circuit is firing rapidly. Typically, it's not turned on, say, in post-operative cases and that sort of thing. People aren't crying in pain. They're simply experiencing pain in the belly where the incision is or the knee, et cetera. Those are examples of the type of pain we're talking about, and it's usually described as sharp, dull, aching, that sort of thing. All right, second type out of four, neuropathic pain. On that timeline, we started to, I showed you that we started to really figure this out in the 80s. Now that's, you might've missed what just happened, so let me show you what neuropathic pain is in a nutshell. It's pain that comes from the nervous system. There is no transduction of too much heat, too much cold, too much pressure or inflammation. Something coming from within the nervous system to the brain without tissue damage uh, per se, without something damaging the tissues. Now we're gonna talk about two types of neuropathic pain. Let's start with neuropathic pain from nerve injury. It turns out that nerve injury, whether it's they're cut or crushed or whatever it is, it's really good at changing the way the nervous system works, which is different from nociceptive pain. So this is the nociceptive pain diagram. Instead of there being a pain stimulus, there is instead physical injury to the nervous system, some sort of modification of the nervous system by chemicals, inflammation, or physical injury that changes the way the nervous system works. And I've put here altered sensory processing. That is the key. I'm gonna come back to this. That is the key for this such that with altered sensory processing, even non-painful, light touch, gentle pressure, that type of stimulus can be transmitted up here to the brain as something painful. And it can be processed through the emotional centers as something painful and unpleasant and miserable. So this is what we're talking about when someone would perceive something lightly brushing on their foot, a diabetic lightly brushing on their foot as painful which we do see that. Also, we can also see this. We can also see the altered sensory processing in the nervous system sending pain signals to the brain when there's absolutely nothing going on, just sending pain signals when there's nothing going on in the tissues. And the number one example of that would be phantom limb pain. And that's an example I will use because I, I actually have found that it's helpful to go through this with patients uh, and say, you know, explain to them that the nervous system when it's changed and how it works by physical injury to nerves, can just send pain signals, make stuff up, it's actually kind of a lie, and send pain signals to the brain about what's going on in the tissues, which has nothing to do with what's going on in the tissues. And that is, the best example would be phantom limb pain. So if the foot hurts and there's no leg, there is not too much pressure, too much heat, too much cold in the foot, right? There's not the nervous system is sending a signal to the brain. It's not in the brain, it's not in their head, it's in the nervous system, the spinal cord in particular. These are other examples. I mentioned diabetic neuropathy, um, brachial plexus injuries, and, and the phenomenon of opioid-induced hyperalgesia probably fits in here, changes the way the nervous system works. Interestingly enough, people will describe this type of pain, neuropathic pain from nerve injury, differently burning, shooting, electrical, with heightened sensitivity to pain. So let's tweak this a little bit and start to talk about how we have come to understand since the <clears throat> turn of the, of the millennium, a, a type of neuropathic pain that comes from experiences. So going back, remember this IASP? They redefined their definition of pain several years, about nine years ago, about 2011, to say that people can report pain in the absence of tissue damage or anything going on in the tissues. Usually this happens for psychological reasons. That's a huge statement. Also a very unfortunate choice of words, right? 
just try telling one of your patients you have pain for psychological reasons and see how well that goes over. We'll come back to how to talk to your patients about this type of pain later in this, in this presentation. So they are acknowledging that people can have pain coming from the nervous system that has nothing to do, is disconnected from, um, not tied to tissue pathology. And here's what they meant. They meant that there's no physical nerve injury, no physical injury at all, rather trauma, toxic stress, changes the sensory processing function of the nerve, nervous system. There is altered sensory processing of pain, of, of stimuli in general, consequent to an experience. So the subtle difference here is, I was just telling you that physical trauma to nerves or metabolic or infectious injury to nerves can alter sensory processing. So can experiences that we live through that don't touch us, traumatic experiences. So we see the same thing. This is actually the same diagram as the physical uh, neuropathic pain from physical damage to nerves. But now we're talking in the upper left corner about neuropathic pain from experiences that reorganize the way the nervous system works so that there's altered sensory processing. And a non-painful stimulus can be perceived as painful. That's really classic for fibromyalgia. Light pressure is perceived as painful. Another thing you might notice here is that the emotional processing of pain seems to be enhanced in the case of neuropathic pain from traumatic experiences, which intuitively sounds, yeah, that makes sense. In the case of trauma-induced spontaneous pain, the altered sensory system can send pain signals to the brain in the absence of anything going on, no, not even light touch. That would be like the fibromyalgia patient saying, I'm burning all over, sitting there in the chair, and there's nothing going on with their tissue. Nothing is even touching them. The nervous system is, again, sort of lying to the brain. But the pain is coming from within the nervous system, which has been changed as a consequence of their experience. And interestingly enough, perhaps as a consequence of the bias to emotional processing of pain, people with this third type of pain, so I've talked about nociceptive, neuropathic from physical damage to nerves, now neuropathic nerve pain from traumatic experiences or toxic stress. This type of pain from toxic stress and trauma will often be described with emotionally charged words such as these. As a matter of fact, these words, if someone calls the pain punishing and cruel, you can almost guarantee that this type of pain is, is what they're dealing with. And I, I've been saying this a few times, so I want to show you a diagram of ascending stimuli coming in through ascending sensory pathways being split in the thalamus and sent to the somatosensory cortex and a familiar part of the brain to you all, the emotional pathway. <clears throat> This type of pain is processed through the anterior cingulate, the insula, <coughs> the basal ganglia, the amygdala, and so on. So in summary, what I'm saying about trauma and toxic stress is somehow it changes the nervous system at its root function, reprograms it, reorganizes the nervous system so that you get all these consequences. Not just chronic pain down there on the left. I talked about short lifespan, which we know about developmental trauma. That's a possible consequence of developmental trauma. There's a lot of other things going on that show significant correlation to um, history of chronic, of trauma or toxic stress. Uh, addiction, insomnia, anxiety, depression, uh, fatigue, obesity, short lifespan. When we actually made up a, a word for people, a term our psychologist did for people with this type of pain, she called it fade syndrome. Fatigue, anxiety, insomnia, depression. Those always seem to come together as a package. We call them the fruit of the trauma tree. That's what, uh, why I drew it this way. The thing to take home from this picture is, not, is that there's more than chronic pain as a consequence of the trauma. There are all these other things and they're really coming as a consequence of changes in the way our DNA is read and transcribed. That's how we can reorganize the nervous system. When I say that to a neurobiologist, I'm saying different genes are being expressed and some genes that we used to use are being shut off. We've, cha we've changed the way we're reading our DNA. If you're into that epigenetic change. So clues to this, 
These are the things that people with this third type of pain, neuropathic pain from experiences that reorganize the nervous system into what I guess we could call a threat adapted nervous system. It's a normal thing, really. It's, a, it's an adaptation to a threatening, life-threatening or toxic environment. So the nervous system makes its threat adapted change that I just showed on that last slide. These are what people with that type of pain, chronic pain, will describe. They say nothing works for my pain, except for medications that surprisingly have psychotropic action. Uh, they'll talk about diffuse pain with no clinical cause evident, meaning no tissue damage, right? So that's where a lot of my colleagues get hung up and I used to get stuck. Can't find anything wrong with the tissues. What's going on with this patient? Just can't find anything. They'll have lots of other somatic complaints, lots of things going wrong with them, mainly digestion, they'll have uh, mental fogginess, things like that, a lot of neurological and GI complaints in particular. Their disability and pain behaviors will seem to be out of proportion and the, the, though their whole be, demeanor will be emotionally charged. And if they say things like, I'm crying in pain, you've got a really strong clue that you're dealing with pain that is chronic pain that's from of the neuropathic type caused by exposure to trauma and so on. And this gal, some of you may recognize her, uh, this gal did an, uh, I think it was in Vogue or Vanity Fair, one of those, now I can't remember, but someone pointed it out to me that Lady Gaga talked about, I was interviewed about her fibromyalgia and she had just the perfect thing to describe fibromyalgia as neuropathic pain as a lay person. She called it a cyclone of anxiety, depression, PTSD, trauma, and panic disorder. So there she's tied it into the trauma, all of which sends the nervous system into overdrive. And then you have nerve pain as a result. She's right. It's a neuropathic pain condition. She calls the nerve, nervous system going into overdrive, but it's really been reorganized. And one of the consequences is a, a bad change, a negative change in the way we process pain stimuli, pain signals. All right, so I'm telling you that trauma can cause chronic pain, and I really owe it to you folks listening, spending time here listening to this, <clears throat> to do a pretty thorough job explaining that there are there's evidence behind what I'm saying. I'm not just giving you my own observations, <clears throat> although my own observations do track with this very well. So there is experimental evidence that psychological trauma leads to altered sensory processing, for sure. And I'm going to provide you in the coming slides experimental evidence that psychological trauma leads to chronic pain, too. So there are three studies that I quoted here, and we'll make sure these slides are available to you, that use different ways of measuring in people uh, their sensitivity to painful stimuli. Things like, how long can you hold your hand in a bucket of ice water? Uh, things like putting pressure on a bone, bony prominence, and increasing it until someone says, actually, that's painful. Could you stop? You can kind of get pain thresholds that way. How long can a person hold their hand in the ice water? How long can a person stand to have a tourniquet on? How much pressure can they handle? What they found in each case, three different studies, three different times, what they found in each case is that Subjects, study subjects with a history of developmental trauma had significantly lower pain thresholds every time, no matter how you measure it. There is a change in sensory processing evident in people who have a history of, of developmental trauma compared to controls who did not. So that's that. And then a really interesting study that sort of sets trauma aside, in my mind anyway, from anxiety. This study compared veterans with anxiety to those who were diagnosed with PTSD and anxiety. They did this pressure on a bony prominence and increased it until the person said, ouch. Now here's the pain range and here's the not pain range. So as they increased the pressure, they said, yeah, that's more and more and more pressure. Ouch, now it's pain right here. And then as they increased the pressure some more, they finally said, stop, please. But they said, yeah, that's more painful, more painful, more painful volunteers. Here's what, th those are people with anxiety and the controls look the same. So anxiety and the controls look the same, but PTSD look different. Once the subject started experiencing pain, they really couldn't tolerate any increase. That's what we call hyperalgesia. 
any increase in pressure once they started feeling pain sent them through the roof. Very different than people with anxiety and control. This difference here in the pain threshold wasn't statistically significant, but I drew the graph as they drew it just for sake of fidelity. What this tells us is that anxiety doesn't seem to change their response to painful stimuli, but PTSD does. To me, this is an evidence that PTSD, so tra trauma, toxic stress, that sort of exposure does something to our nervous system that anxiety doesn't. It's not just all about, oh, anxiety, depression, and, and PTSD all together is a bucket. They can make people more sensitive to pain. Probably not. And there's the difference right there <clears throat> between those two groups. So I, I won't get too deep into uh, the epidemiology of determining whether two things are associated or one causes the other. But I'm going to use the terms from the Bradford Hill criteria in case anyone's familiar with them. So there is evidence that psychological trauma does cause chronic pain, not associated with. We see that in the literature all the time, but does cause. What this study looks at adult trauma and showed that it looked at the prevalence of psychological abuse and relationship dysfunction as adults, um, how that correlated to chronic pain treatment, to chronic complaints of chronic pain. And they found that 50% um, of people being treated for chronic pain reported at least one type of abuse experience in the past 12 months. So the abuse predated the onset of chronic pain and there was a strong association. Uh, people who weren't being treated for chronic pain would report uh, at least one type of abuse experience and so on, much less than 50%, about 12%, I think it was. This looks at developmental trauma, where we have more data. Now, this goes all the way back to 2005 for a reason. This is a, systemic, a systematic review of the literature in 2005, just to point out to you all that we've known this for a while. It's 15 years ago. And this is published in the Clinical Journal of Pain, telling us that no matter how you slice it and dice it, it looks like developmental trauma is there when we see people with chronic pain. They looked at individuals who reported being abused or neglected in childhood, and they reported more symptoms and more related conditions compared to others. People with chronic pain, when you look at them, were more likely to report having been abused or neglected in childhood than people without chronic pain. Then they took patients with chronic pain found that they were more likely to have been abused or neglected in childhood than non-patients. So this is saying people who seek care for their chronic pain are more likely than people who have chronic pain issues but don't seek medical care for it to have the, the trauma in their past. And people from the community reporting pain were more likely to have to report having been abused or neglected than individuals from the com community not reporting pain. There's a lot of different, looking at different populations, no matter how you slice it, it looks like the history of childhood trauma and toxic stress predated the chronic pain, and there's a strong association. Look at this bottom curve where I have this. This is a fascinating paper I, I suggest you all might want to read because of some of the other findings in it. But what they showed here is a dose response. This is another thing you need to find in order to say there's causation. You need to say the more ACEs there are, the more developmental trauma there is, the higher the dose the more pain people will have, and they actually found a positive slope. On this side, you could take these to mean the probability that a person would have a chronic pain condition, and it approaches one when you get to six ACEs. There's a clear dose response here between the exposure to the, the, the dose or the burden of developmental trauma and the likelihood people are gonna have chronic pain. And so it goes. Finally, and this is often a question asked, <clears throat> I'll just address it here. Um, chronic pain related to trauma shows reversibility. These are two studies, one on EMDR in 2016, and then um, a random I, I systematic review actually of six studies in 2019 that showed us that if we treat trauma, pain gets better. So that's what reversibility means. If this idea that developmental trauma and or adult trauma can lead to chronic pain is true, well then treating the trauma should help treat the pain. And so far, that's the answer we get. In 2019, six randomized controlled clinical trials that demonstrate the efficacy of EMDR in treating uh, different pain conditions. And this one looked at a small group of people. I just put it in there 
because it was the first one of its kind that I'm aware of, that showed that people who didn't get EMDR did not approve. They were getting improve. They were getting care as usual for their chronic pain, which would be injections, medications, including opioids and physical therapy, diet, and so on. But 50% of the treatment group who got EMDR reported clinically significant pain decrease, and that sustained at six months follow-up. That's kind of key to me. If we're treating trauma in a way that really reprograms the nervous system, the pain relief should be sustainable, and it looks like it is. It doesn't come back. And there's more, a little bit more to it. When There's sort of a confusion between threat and pain that we see. There are two studies that show us that people who have experienced trauma, the prefrontal cortex is underdeveloped. You folks are probably aware of that. Um, that means that people who are severely traumatized don't ass assess threat well and they can't override <laughs> their threat response. When the amygdala gets going, they can't really override it by saying, look, I'm in a safe place. It's hard to unwind that. There's also research evidence that people with PTSD have fear learning abnormalities. And what that all means is this, the hypothesis I would put to, put to you is that over and above there being a, a change in the sensory processing of pain signals. <clears throat> There's something else about people who have a history of trauma. They can't distinguish threat from non-threat threat very well. Um, and oftentimes they can't distinguish pain from threat and they can't use environmental non-threat cues to override the threat pain circuits. So they can get into this condition pretty easily. Threat is pain, pain is threat, and they can't get out of that um, by using environmental cues. So that's sort of a, an additional, uh, sort of a cherry on top of the connection between trauma and pain in addition to the altered sensory processing. What does that look like? So I'm done with the with the kind of the heavy duty slides on this kind of stuff. But what does that look like in a typical chronic pain patient? This is a typical primary care chronic pain patient that um, I sifted out and de-identified when I was doing some consulting about two years ago. If you look at their chronic pain, it's terrible. Very severe, very very severe, very severe. Been been there for years in this particular patient. This is a GAD7. This particular person, this is their writing, maxed the GAD7 out. Not only that, this is the ACE, the original 10 version, ACE question, nine plus. Meaning that, and that's not the patient, that's one of the providers. Meaning the plus means we thought that number three, the sexual trauma history was kind of the, the 900 pound gorilla. And there's evidence to say that sexual trauma is the most potent trauma at reprogramming the nervous system and leading to chronic pain, that that was when we put the plus, there was a history of sexual trauma. So this person had a severe, severe burden of developmental trauma. And that is a typical chronic pain patient. None of this other than this, the, they knew the, the primary care clinic knew the patient hurt. They didn't know about this. And they certainly weren't screening for developmental trauma, as I said in my opening. So they didn't know that. So trauma treatment would be the treatment for that patient. And I'm going to show you an, a, an example of such a patient and the outcome with trauma treatment. So I've told you three types of pain. The fourth and last one would be emotional pain from social rejection or grief. And there's plenty of evidence to show us that grief is painful and social rejection is painful. <clears throat> there is no evidence to show that it's a permanent change in the nervous system, which is fortunate. Um, there's anecdotal evidence amongst my colleagues. They, they certainly feel that people improve quite a bit with grief, grief therapy when it comes to their physical condition and pain. Um, we don't have a lot of the similar studies that I've showed you in emotional, to, in the area of emotional pain, grief and social rejection. This is a fourth category though that I think, I, I feel needs to be held out separately. <clears throat> and we'll talk about that in when we come to how you assess somebody who says they hurt. So let's talk about a real patient that I saw about 15 years ago. And I put the headline here, can real pain occur for psychological reasons only? The answer is yes, obviously. So this was her pain diagram. Uh, this was who she was. So that pain diagram again is pain all over if you didn't see it. And there's all there are also if you can see my pointer, she talks about the pain scaring her there. She sort of starts to give us a hint that there is 
an emotional processing uh, bias here. This was a school teacher, family, three kids, both parents worked. Uh, she was already on disability for pain that began three years earlier, suddenly out of the blue, no explanation. Uh, she hurt all over and she had been diagnosed with fibromyalgia, lupus, erythematosus, chronic Lyme disease, spent tens of thousands of dollars actually uh, on antibiotic treatment for that with no benefit, was diagnosed as having multiple sclerosis and a few other things. So three years into this, no physical tissue-based condition was found. So now it's, you, you know, you all are thinking, well, yeah, it's probably this other type of pain. But this just goes to show you how sort of dense the um, medical system is to pain that isn't from tissues. The, the, my colleagues just kept looking for a tissue source of pain. And she was put on oxycodone as well as uh, benzodiazepine at the same time. And she said that made her more relaxed. She didn't say it really helped her pain, but she said the oxycodone helped relax her. I would put it to you, by the way, that this was a, a person at risk for an accidental overdose who had no evidence of addiction. Uh, an addictionologist did see her, no evidence. Here's the, here's sort of the big reveal. I took this, this family on as a patient and after a 45 minute interview, we couldn't get to what happened around the time of onset. I kept asking questions about trauma and that sort of thing. When they were walking out of the door, the husband turned around, pulled his wife back in and said, wait a minute, honey, about a month before your pain started, you were held hostage at a, at a, a quick mart or something like that. And the guy put a knife to your throat and the sheriff had to shoot him out from behind you. Remember that? And they both looked at me sort of with this, could that have anything to do with it? <laughs> look on their face. And it's not funny, but uh, I'm laughing because yeah, it could have something to do with it. She was physically unharmed. The pain syndrome started about a month after this hostage situation, which is about how long it takes for the nervous system to rewire and reprogram so that it processes pain differently. It takes a few weeks at least. And in her case, um, in her case, somatic experiencing was what was available twice a week for six months and she went back to work. Uh, she got off her oxycodone and she didn't need those medications anymore because trauma treatment is pain treatment. And if there's a message uh, underneath all of this, it's that trauma treatment was pain treatment for her and that's all she needed, not all that other stuff, but no one had screened or picked it up. So to summarize what I've taken you through here in the last 40, 45 minutes, what is pain in 2019 and now 2020? It's an experience produced by any combination of these, often a combination, no susception, that no susceptive pain that we all understand, but then three types of pain that are less mm, appreciated. Neuropathic pain from physical nerve damage or disease, really not well appreciated. Neuropathic pain from a threat adapted nervous system, from trauma and toxic stress and grief or rejection, social rejection. Those to me are four distinct ways we can get the pain circuits firing in our brains. And you could see that someone might be in a bad car wreck, have broken bones, the trauma of the car wreck, of uh, losing their job in trying to recover, the pain, the surgery can be traumatic and you can lose your job, lose connections with people. You can get all of these going together, certainly. I will tell you right up front though, I'll get to the punchline, is that in my chronic pain clinic for over a decade, by far the majority of people coming in on high doses of opioid in 2010, 2011, 2012 had this type of pain and it was unrecognized. They had no, no recognition that there was any trauma in their history or that there could be a connection between the, their terrible developmental trauma, like that patient I showed you, and what they were experiencing physically now. I threw in nociplastic pain. I'm sorry, that's pronounced nociplastic pain. It's a horrible word, but it's what my colleagues at the International Association for the Study of Pain came up with in 2017. So I'd like you folks to have at least heard the word nociplastic. What it means is that third type of pain I've been talking mostly about, the threat-adapted nervous system, trauma-induced chronic pain. 
that change in, in the uh, sensory processing of pain. Their definition is right on, but I just hate this word. Pain that arises from altered nociception despite no clear evidence of actual or threatened tissue damage causing the activation of peripheral nociceptors. Big sentence there. So there's, it's not nociceptive. There's no too much pressure, heat, cold. That's what they're trying to say. Or evidence of disease or lesion of the nervous system. So there's not physical damage to the nervous system. It's, they're basically defining um, this trauma-induced hyperalgesia or trauma-induced pain as pain that isn't those other types of pain. They're, they're really struggling because they're not ready yet. They weren't ready to talk about uh, the connection with trauma. That will change. But we need, to, we need to go on. We need to say that culture, beliefs, values, and assumptions are actually how we interpret um, pain stimuli through that lens and the emotional state as well. A great example of this is a study that was done on veterans compared to civilians who had lost a limb around World War II. So veterans in combat who had lost a limb in combat versus civilians back in the United States who had an industrial accident or car accident and lost their leg. And basically the premise was who does who is going to do better? You'd think it would be the civilians, but it was the veterans. And what the, the, the researchers concluded was that the veterans uniformly looked at losing a leg as in a way a good thing because it got them out of combat, it got them home. Whereas the civilians looked at losing a leg differently as losing their job and a bad thing. So the same sort of pain problem, nerve pain and, and an injury to the leg, but interpreted through a different lens depending on, on the, um, the beliefs and assumptions about the pain. Anxiety and depression certainly do modify pain. They don't help it. The more anxiety and depression there is, the evidence would show um, sort of in a dose response effect, the more pain it hurts and the more um, upsetting and unpleasant it is, I guess. But also the family. The family relation and relationships modify um, our response to pain, how we interpret it and what we do. If headaches and abdominal pain are how you get people to do things for you, the headaches and abdominal pain aren't gonna go away and you're gonna keep reporting them. It's a simple way of looking at family and work relationships, how they how they might impact. So here it is all together. When I'm seeing or you're seeing a person who says, I have chronic pain, you're looking at this cake, but you haven't cut it open yet. And it certainly doesn't have the labels on it. You're just looking at a big cake with six layer cake with white frosting. When you cut it open, you might find that there is more neuropathic pain from trauma and stress than there is no susception. These are all the possible layers that you have to go through. You have to kind of start at the bottom here and work your way up. These are the four ways that the brain pain circuits can be spun up. I've just talked about them, plus cognitions and emotions play a role in how we interpret it, as do relational consequences. That's another filter that pain behaviors come through. In order to understand somebody who has chronic pain, we really need to look diagnostically at all six layers. What does that mean? That means that me, trained as a MD, a medical doctor, I can get at these two. That's really, that's really what I'm trained to do. Really only two out of six. I need help from my behavioral health colleagues to look at these four and people who know what to look for. Thus these, these talks so that you know to look for these sorts of things and know that they're related to pain, these two. And the, those two. It has to be pain evaluation to get to the right diagnosis has to be a multidisciplinary exercise when we're dealing with chronic pain. Obviously not with appendicitis, but chronic pain, yes. All right, so in, in uh, sort of taking you folks towards uh, finishing this up, I want to talk about implications. <clears throat> and we'll come back to the opioid crisis and my, my hypothesis about why that went out of control when we did what looked like it would make sense on the surface. We limited the supply. That would certainly make sense if it was an addiction crisis, but it went out of control instead. First and foremost, this is out of the, the Bible on chronic pain by Gatchel and Turk. And I just wanted to show you that the relationships between psychological disorders and chronic pain have been conceived traditionally as coming in and affecting what happens once somebody has hurt or harmed. They're talking about physical injury of some sort here is what their conception, they were conceptualizing 
Um, but that leads you down this path. It could leave a person down this path of fear, anxiety, worry, psychological problems, et cetera, et cetera. Point is, this diagram starts with physical injury again, just the nociceptive, just that, that type of pain. As I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to explain here, pain can start without physical injury. So this whole concept, the whole concept of how we've looked at chronic pain really needs to be reworked in the context of how experience can actually be the source of chronic pain. The implications for pain treatment then would be that pain from tissue damage, what do you do? Well, you diagnose and treat the physical condition, sure. But pain from trauma, what do you do? Treat the trauma, diagnose and treat the trauma and mental health sequela of the trauma. That's gonna be the most important thing. And I have had people with pure, if you wanna call it this, pain for psychological reasons, but I wouldn't, pure pain related to or caused by developmental trauma or adult traumas, such as I showed you, that purely need the treatment of the psychological trauma, and that is their pain treatment. More often than not, it's a mix of th these two treatments. Finally, um, with regard to terminology and so on, this idea of calling, calling things chronic pain syndrome and complex pain, you know, those need to go in the trash can. We'll be much better off if we can talk to each other and talk to our patients about the four types of pain and kind of break it down because these four understandings of what, what get the pain circuits going in the brain lead directly to specific treatments that are very different depending on which one of these four we have. Saying chronic pain syndrome really isn't helpful. Now, when you talk to patients, I had, I had hinted at this, we used to talk to people our patients and I used to about pain coming from the body that you know we have to find the source of pain in the body somewhere and if we can't we just give up we shrug our shoulders and say I can't figure it out that approach was based on an understanding of nociceptive pain only if all we understand is nociceptive pain too much pressure too much heat too much cold inflammation then this is as far as we can get but with what I've showed you we can start to talk to people about a more sophisticated understanding of pain, that there are two types of neuropathic pain that come from in the nervous system. And then the emotional pain, I'll put it over here, just uh, kind of, um, I guess that's kind of arbitrary, <laughs> but I'll put it over here to balance things out. What, the key, what I want to get across here is if you draw this out, the body, nervous system, mind, and you say, I think your pain's in the nervous system, you are going down a path that is more likely to be accepted by the patient, and it is also biologically correct, as far as we know. So you're not telling them a fib. You're telling them it's not in your head, it's in your nervous system. I have found that to be probably the single best way to get people to engage in treating their trauma because we're treating their nervous system. And they, we can treat uh, depression and anxiety as well, and the grief and loss as well but focusing on the nervous system really works. Where we've gotten into trouble is with the mind-body, mind-body in articles, textbooks, and so on, because if it's not in the body, where is it? It's in their head. So I'd say, even though this is one of our favorite things and there's, there's mind-body medicine, which is a real thing, it, it, re it relegates the nervous system to this little tiny hyphen and it just really doesn't help us when we're talking to patients. If it's not in the body, it must be in the mind is not accurate. If it's not in the body, it could also be in the nervous system. That is very helpful, just drawing that out for people. And then you can go on to say, as I said, well, there's different people, physical therapists, orthopedists, neurosurgeons, rheumatologists, pain docs, PCPs, who do these different things on the left for nociceptive pain. But look at this, there's actually more activity that's going on here. Look at all the things that we can do for neuropathic pain and other people that get involved. So you can kind of see that, get that slide back up there. There's a whole different approach to treating the nervous system, which we might combine with that previous slide with the body. And then of course the mind would be um, this, multidisciplinary treatment following multidisciplinary evaluation. Implications for the opioid crisis. So, Let's look at what our leaders are saying. I'm gonna show you an interview from last year from the Attorney General of Massachusetts, 
Um, and I don't know. So she's talking about the drugs being addictive. I hope you could hear that clip. She's being interviewed about the opioid crisis last year. The focus is addiction. That's why I showed that there, not to, to, to give her a hard time, a future possible president of the United States there. But if that's true, if the, if the future is, uh, oh, I'm just getting noticed that you couldn't hear that. So this, uh, this video clip is the, Attorney General of Massachusetts talking about uh, how addictive the drugs, the, the prescription opioids are, and that we need to get after addiction. That's the essence of that. The, however, getting after addiction didn't work. <laughs> it just didn't work. So we must have missed something. Now, just to throw this into the mix, this is Norma, Nora Volkow. She's the director of NIDA. National Institute on Drug Abuse, and she's here quoting an article that she helped write in the England Journal, and it's been um, reworked and, and checked, fact-checked, and pretty accurate, that the stats really show that addiction occurs only in a small percentage of people who are exposed to prescription opioids. So if that's true, and we came in here and we treated this like it was a crisis of addiction, yet addiction was not the main thing, or at least not what was affecting a good chunk, maybe half or a third of those people, we might have made the wrong move. It might be because we treated this as an addiction crisis when there's something else going on, such as this. Here's my hypothesis for you. Many Americans who experienced an overdose of prescription opioid are not addicts. We don't know how many, most, half, a third. Rather, they're people who present with physical complaints such as pain, using opioid to treat anxiety and PTSD and trauma. Now, the key thing for you all to understand that I have to tell you is that opioids are very good for treating anxiety. There's animal data that opioids are just as good as benzodiazepines for treating animal models of anxiety. In other words, opioids are being used as a psychotropic by people who are in chaotic lifestyle and living a, 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 on the edge, lots of anxiety, PTSD, impulsive, they might drink, they might take an extra tablet when they're stressed, uh, nothing to do with their pain. And here they are with a cabinet full of oxycodone 80 tablets, 80 milligram tablets. Now, I just told you that we're treating, uh, I, I believe that we've been treating um, chronic pain patients with opioids, what we're re when we're doing that, what we've really been doing is using opioids as, as psychotropics to treat the consequences of trauma because so many chronic pain patients, we don't know exactly how, how many, work hasn't been done yet, but so many chronic pain patients really have that third type of pain. This is some evidence that what I'm saying is correct. Davis, not, not me, Davis, but another Davis published this in 2017. He published that 51% of the opioid painkiller prescriptions go to the 16% of Americans with significant mental health diagnoses of anxiety or depression, which could be markers for their trauma. Another way of looking at it that he said over on the right there is an American with depression or anxiety is four times more likely as of 2017 to be prescribed an opioid painkiller than an American without those diagnoses. Now you could say, well, yeah, everybody who has chronic pain is depressed and anxious, but you can also flip that script around and say, no, they are actually using the opioid to treat anxiety and depression. That is the consequence, just like the chronic pain, the, op the anxiety and depression are the consequence of their developmental trauma or adult trauma. So I'm sort of reworking, asking, answering this question right here then asking who are these people who accidentally overdose on prescription opioid or who have jumped from prescription to street drugs and accidentally overdose on fentanyl. Well, there's certainly non-addicts who have obtained opioid from friends or family at a party, that sort of thing, and actually overdose. There, there's the eighth grader 10 years ago who took an oxycodone 80 and didn't wake up. Um, no addiction history there. But there's people who prescribed opioid for a painful illness legitimately that responds to 
opioid accidentally overdoses, yes, they are not terribly safe medications. People with no addiction disorder prescribed opioid chronically for terrible rheumatoid arthritis or whatever it was may have overdosed. Addicts, absolutely. People with opioid use disorder flocked in to medical offices that were prescribing opioid to get their opioid there instead of the street, no doubt about it. It doesn't sound like that many developed new addiction disorders. What I think happened is people with opioid use disorder came in and talked about their chronic pain and got their opioid. But there's this fourth group. People with trauma-induced hyperalgesia with experiences that cause neuropathic pain, with a threat-adapted nervous system and altered sensory processing, using opioids to treat anxiety, depression, and PTSD, accidentally overdose. That could be the re missing the, that group of people and treating them as if they had an opioid use disorder could be the reason we just threw gasoline on the fire. If they're, if at least half or more of the people who have accidentally overdosed in the last decade really fit that category. How many might there be? Well, these are the, the medical diagnoses that when you review charts, people with trauma induced hyperalgesia with that type of experiential neuropathic pain from tra traumatic experiences, these are the physical diagnoses they typically get. It's a long list. Uh, and just some of them. When you review charts of people who clearly have had significant development mental trauma, that person I showed you earlier with an A score of nine plus and a GAD7 that was maxed out, that person, um, I, I know who that person is. That person was diagnosed with about half the things on this list. So was the woman who was held hostage. She was given all these diagnoses because she sought help from medical people who didn't really know any different. That's all they knew. My point is, if you review charts and look for people with chronic pain from all these different conditions, there are a lot of folks out there on opioid still for these conditions who really have that third type of pain and are at risk for overdose. So in the end, kind of wrapping this up, the idea is to treat the root issue. Treat trauma and toxic stress, grief, shame, and guilt, and help reprogram the nervous system back towards healthy. You're taking a threat-adapted nervous system and making it a calm, peace-adapted nervous system. That's what trauma therapy does, as I've observed it as a, sort of an outsider, uh, as an MD outsider. That's one way of putting it. So for many, trauma treatment is their pain management. So the idea would be that we would that we would um, excuse me just a moment <laughs> that we would allocate more trauma resources to addressing the opioid crisis. The question is, why don't we do this? Well, we don't support behavioral medical integration. We haven't been very good about supporting behavioral medical integration. Either in the diagnosis, the prevention side, or the diagnosis or the treatment of people with chronic pain. Now that isn't because we haven't thought of it. Back in about 2000, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services introduced the health and behavior codes. And I found that a, a lot of people in the behavioral health community aren't aware of these, so I'm gonna point them out. This is almost 20 years ago. The purpose of these billing codes were to allow behavioral health practitioners to diagnose and treat physical conditions like heart disease, like COPD, like diabetes. And here's a definition for them. The health and behavior assessment procedures or codes are used to identify the psychological, behavioral, emotional, cognitive, and social factors, the whole pain cake, in other words, important to the prevention, treatment, and management of physical health problems. The focus is not on mental health, but on the biopsychosocial factors important to physical health problems and treatments. Well, this fits perfectly, right? Fits perfectly into allowing behavioral health practitioners to start helping people like me when I can look, I can only diagnose two layers of the pain cake, the, the nociceptive and the neuropathic pain from nerve injury to get involved on the diagnosis side and on the treatment side of helping me 
uh, with those patients. It was a great idea. <laughs> the question I have for my behavioral health colleagues is to what degree do psychosocial factors drive this patient's physical experience when I'm dealing with one patient? Uh, on a population level, it would be the same question. How do we identify cases in the population where psychosocial factors are driving the patient's physical experience, whether it's asthma or whether it's chronic pain, and what do we do about it? That's the question I want answered. The problem is <laughs> that these codes were under reimbursed. For uh, over two hours of work, CMS paying $90.72 is not going to cut it. That's not going to attract a lot of people. There is another problem beyond just the, the under reimbursement for it for the time and effort put in. Um, and that's that many of my behavioral health colleagues haven't really been trained in working on the behavioral drivers of physical conditions. So there's a, a training issue as well, but primarily getting people interested in doing this sort of thing is gonna take, uh, require us to, to start paying adequately, at least the same amount we would pay for treating depression, anxiety, schizophrenia. If it doesn't pay as well as that, well then why would people step into it? And they haven't yet. Although the idea is there. So I wanted to just show you there uh, that uh, our Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services kind of gets what this, what this talk is about. Yeah, trauma is something we need to diagnose and treat and we'll create codes for it and they're out there, but I think if we want to see a multidisciplinary whole health care, whole person health care implemented, we're going to have to uh, pay my behavioral health colleagues uh, to do the medical work that I need, helping, helping with the psychological, psychosocial factors that drive medical conditions, as well as treating the behavioral health conditions themselves. Now, there is some light at the end of the tunnel. This is the new Surgeon General for the state of California, and she actually gave a great TED Talk, if you haven't heard it, 2014 TED Talk by Nadine Burke Harris, that it covers what I've been talking about. She really was talking about, from a pediatrician's perspective, pediatric morbidity and mortality and problems being driven by uh, developmental trauma. She wasn't talking about chronic pain per se. I'm coming at it from the chronic pain perspective, but we get to the same place. And now that she's the Surgeon General, uh, she's put out a statement that says that she believes a public health scale intervention around adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress is going to be the biggest public health advancement of our time. So she's talking about population scale intervention. That's, uh, that's not my area. My area is one patient at a time. But I would say the same thing. I would say that be, for a person like me, being able to engage my behavioral health colleagues in diagnosis and treatment, one patient at a time, of chronic pain and um, getting at the root causes, including trauma and toxic stress, and treating those would be a huge change because not only is chronic pain one of the fruit of the trauma tree, but also 20 year shorter lifespan, diabetes, obesity, COPD, heart disease, stroke, cancer, inflammatory uh, rheumatologic diseases, and so on. Uh, I, I believe that my behavioral health colleagues, all of you folks um, listening, really hold the key to the next great leap forward in medical treatment of what we think of as physical medical problems. She's come out to say that every student in California in public school is going to be screened for childhood trauma. So that's where she's starting. And they're actually, believe it or not, paying primary health providers, PC, uh, family practitioners and pediatricians, that would be, to do the screening. So that's how it works. You pay them to put that box on their, on their uh, clinic notes, on their intake clinic notes, and they do the screening. And that will help set the foundation for understanding how severe the problem is, where it's severe, and where we need to make public health interventions. So there's hope. It's going to progress slowly, but the more of us that understand the connection between developmental trauma and chronic pain, and probably between chronic pain 
from developmental trauma being treated inappropriately with opioid, but not recognized, and the opioid crisis, the better we'll be. So thanks very much for listening. I'm going to leave some time for questions now. And if you have any questions, feel free to put them in there. Looks like we do not. Here we go. One question that uh, may have come up in this or a previous one is, are there any screening tools to evaluate and score neurop neuropathy pain, meaning pain from nerve injury versus emotional pain? Uh, no, they're not. And that is one area of research that's wide open uh, as far as deciding whether what which type of pain you, we, we're dealing with. With a couple exceptions, the McGill pain questionnaire is useful for determining if a person has what the uh, ISP called pain for psychological reasons. They, they have a list of pain descriptors that I actually showed you in this presentation. They ask the person taking the, the test to circle which pain descriptors accurately describe their pain. They've actually, it's actually been shown that if people describe their pain circle, um, punishing and cruel, those two words almost guaranteed to have a significant dose, a significant portion of their pain related to developmental or adult trauma, uh, that type of change in the nervous system, as opposed to physical injury to the nervous system. Uh, physical injury to the nervous system is usually diagnosed through more through history and neurological exam, just to let you know that. And then there's a question about, uh, oh, when someone is out of opioid medication, how do we distinguish between pain that the opioid is treating and pain associated from withdrawal from the medicine? And that opens up a, um, a, a big area related to tapering opioids. As far as distinguishing pain from withdrawal, which is painful, the easiest way to do that is to start people on uh, something like buprenorphine uh, and see how they feel. And then once they're feeling better, ask them if, um, if we were treating pain that they had before they started withdrawal or not. Generally, people who have a lot of arthritis or a lot of a chronic pain condition, and I see them a lot in my current practice at Sierra Tucson, when, when they go into withdrawal, they'll hurt a lot worse. And it's really a combination of the two. It's a combination of their previous pain, unmasked, not treated with any opioid, so it really hurts, plus the pain of withdrawal. So I guess what I'm saying is distinguishing between the two it isn't really that important because a person in that condition is probably going to need to be treated at least for a period of time in um, mat, in a mat type of clinic uh, with buprenorphine or with methadone. Because because have, stopping their opioids suddenly is going to leave them with uh, pretty severe physical pain and get in the way of their rehabilitation, if for no other reason. And the other reasons are that MAT therapy has been shown to, to reduce harm for sure. But I wanted to speak to you folks uh, just a, for a little bit about stopping opioids. It may not be something that you do, uh, but it's worth understanding and, and knowing about. In 2010, the enthusiasm was to wean people off opioids quickly for a variety of reasons. Providers were afraid of the DEA for good reason, it seems. And we kind of thought that we were dealing with people who really more or less had developed an addiction disorder, opioid use disorder, so we wanted to get them off the medication and that would be appropriate. The results of that were actually catastrophic. Taking people off of medication quickly probably encouraged a lot of folks to try street drugs, but it also actually led to, and this is well documented, increase in suicide. Um, we've seen that in the uh, um, in a number of research projects coming out of the VA and out of the civilian world. And that prompted the DEA to 
put out a warning, I think it was in April of last year of 2019, a warning to all prescribers of pain medication not to taper people off of opioids quickly. So kind of a reverse walking that, hey, let's get everybody off opioids fast, walking that back to say, don't take them off so quickly. In that FDA statement, they did go so far as to say, think about treating the psychosocial factors. So what they were really kind of working around there was, hmm, what the, they didn't realize, we didn't realize it, but we were treating a lot of people with a significant trauma history with opioid. They were using their opioid, at least in part, to help allay anxiety, depression, their PTSD symptoms. And when it was removed, not only did they hurt more because they had that type of neuropathic pain, but their psychotropic was gone and they decompensated. That's really where that statement, I believe, is coming from. So we, with regard to tapering opioid, we've had to, um, we've had to revise how we go about doing this and we've come full circle back to where I ended this presentation. I ended this presentation by saying that we need to figure out a way to enable and support the behavioral health community to work with the medical community. If a person is taking a lot of opioid and we diagnose that third or fourth type of pain, pain related to, to trauma, a threat adapted nervous system, they're going to need the behavioral health treatment before we wean the opioid. We can't just pull away the psychotropic medication. Remember that Davis publication, that's what's going on. So we can't just stop it. We need to implement appropriate behavioral health care first and then wean them off. And that's a dance that a medical provider and a behavioral health provider have to do together. So on the back end of the opioid crisis, there's going to be, there is a need for significant increase in cooperation between behavioral health and medical uh, communities in helping people sort of reset from just using opioid as a psychotropic to appropriate treatment of the root issues. Last comment on that, if we, let me just play the devil's advocate. So what's so wrong with using opioids as a psychotropic? As a, psychotropic? a lot of those folks live chaotic lifestyles, they're stressed. Uh, when they're stressed even further, they may drink, they may take more medication, they're at high risk. Many of them are at high risk for accidental overdose. And many of them, have done just that, yet been miscategorized as related as the, uh, an overdose related to addiction when it wasn't. Um, I think we have some more. Yes, I'm seeing some more of these questions coming in. Um, what if someone has worked through past trauma? That's not a new one. Um, I'm not seeing new questions unless they're at the bottom. And here they are. <laughs> okay. Are you gathering data from Sierra Tucson patients to support your hypothesis? Answer, yes. <laughs> we have a very strong outcomes, um, outcomes data system and we're collecting all kinds of variables. We do a pretty thorough psychometric evaluation to try to figure out what's happening and we're, we're implementing a one-year follow-up as well. So the answer is yes. Uh, to whom will we refer our patient to to get evaluated? And I can't tell if that's coming fr from a behavioral health or a medical provider. If it was a medical provider, it's kind of tough because it's hard to find a behavioral health provider who, who will participate. From a behavioral health provider, um, again, you're, if you have a person who you believe is using opioid as a psychotropic, maybe there's a trauma history, and complaining of chronic pain, they have that third type of pain, you're going to need a, a medical professional who understands what we're talking about. And the, I hate to tell you, but that's kind of an interview sort of a thing. You have to talk to people on the phone to see if they get this stuff. I will tell you that the typical pain clinic, the uh, pain management clinic, that's not where you'll find people who understand um, the relationship between trauma, pain, overdose and addiction, all those sorts of things. Um, my general impression is that nurse practitioners in those pain clinics are more likely than the, than the health, than the MDs themselves, because the MDs are often focused more on the procedures and the nurse practitioners more on whole health care. I have a client who I can't do this trauma work with because his pain is so high. Well, that's a, that's a tough one. I would say nine out of 10 people who say they can't do trauma work because their pain is too high 
are caught in that loop of pain threat, pain threat. And furthermore, they're not ready to do the trauma work. And that is a trick. It's, it, it, I have an advantage of working at a place with uh, a residential facility where we really have 24 seven high touch on the clients and we can implement things like acupuncture and craniosacral therapy and massage and get them exercising a little bit and start to bring down their fear and open them up to working on the trauma, that sort of a thing. I have plenty of pain patients who tell me it's not, don't talk to me about my nervous system or my mind or anything like that. I have pain in my body when clearly that's not the case. They clearly carry a heavy burden of developmental trauma. Uh, and the trick there is to keep meet them where they're at. Don't challenge them. Don't say, no, no, you really have nervous system pain. You have to admit that. Just work with their, I'll say, okay, let's work with your physical pain. Let's talk about how the nervous system is relaying that to the mind and just work on the nervous system as part of working on your physical pain. Generally, that's what punches through. Nine out of 10 of the patients that you described there in that question, um, people who say their pain is too great to do any trauma work are like that. Maybe 99 out of 100 because really doing the, doing the trauma work is not something that is going to stress their body. So finding a way in for those people is generally how you be patient, find a way in, how you will get around that. Uh, can you talk a little about the pain programs here at Tucson specifically? Why would a person want to consider a residential level of care for pain? Um, and that's pretty simply when a person isn't getting and making the progress they want to make with outpatient therapy as usual. If they're not making progress, pain interferes significantly with their life, that's when a residential program would come into play. Um, you, you folks that are um, under 60 wouldn't know that in the 70s and 80s, there were many programs like CR Tucson, residential and PHP type of programs. Um, insurance decided, they, they were actually doing great work and producing great results, but insurance has decided that that wasn't something they were gonna support is how I understand it. So by the year 2000, they were mostly gone. What kind of training does someone from the behavioral health side need to do this? The psychologist I work with did a health psychology um, uh, residency or uh, training. She was trained as a health psychologist. Her first job was in a cardiac rehab facility where they were working on the behavioral drivers of behavioral relapse that would lead to a second cardiac surgery. Uh, and so that was kind of the core of her training. Um, outside of health psychology, I am not aware of a focus yet in our behavioral health community on training people how to work in the hyphen between mind and body. Both, and this isn't all about behavioral health. Medical providers need this training as well. At the University of Arizona, we're just starting to get that into the medical school, talking about educating our, our students there about how psychological factors, behavioral health history experiences can affect the nervous system through changing the way the DNA is read and transcribed. It isn't really that common on the behavioral health side outside of health psychology that I know of, or nor is it that common on the medical side. I'll tell you that training in trauma treatments such as somatic experiencing, EMDR, um, organizational intelligence, a variety of the others does really touch on that, does really start to work on the hyphen. Beyond that, I'm not aware of any formal training, but we need as much of it as we can get in as short as time as possible. Uh, here is a slightly longer question. In my experience, some chronic pain clients are terrified to approach the issue. Definitely, because they can't imagine living without pain meds. Suggestion of how to help them and see trauma treatment as a way out rather than just a way to take my away my pain meds. Uh, well, all the things we do to gain their trust, take it easy, go slow, start explaining about the nervous system, how it's time to work on that. And provided the patient isn't at risk for imminent overdose, isn't um, uh, you know suicidal, that sort of thing, isn't a high risk, we leave them on their medication until the Behavioral Health Foundation is established. Think of it about getting people off of Pill Island. Imagine millions of Americans stuck on this island in the ocean, Pill Island. 
you can't just blow up the island, like you said in this question. You've got to build a bridge off, get them on the bridge, then you can blow up the island or at least start chipping away at it. So you have to, um, have to establish appropriate behavioral health treatments first. And the patients often will, when they're ready, they'll let you know. I've had plenty of patients taper themselves off of opioid without asking me even, just come back and say, I'm off. I went through withdrawal, it was horrible, but I'm done. Because they sort of felt in their mind that, you know, I'm ready to be done with this. I don't recommend that. Uh, I recommend we help them off the medication. But um, clearly it's about getting them on the bridge off of Pill Island first, and that bridge primarily is behavioral treatments. I would like to know if patients are stunned if their pain does go away with trauma treatment. Uh, yes, <laughs> I also believe that addressing ACEs is beneficial um, for behavioral health, but now I see it may benefit pain. Yes, well, that was more of a comment. Um, would you recommend trauma screening for kids entering kindergarten? Not an expert, me, on this, but yes. Uh, I, the earlier, the better. Um, we can start getting at social determinants of developmental trauma that way. We can start finding hot spots. A lot of it is the type of epidemiology work we're doing with the virus now. And I think we have time for a couple more. Let's see. Uh, I saw there that duloxetine is used for pain. And how have you found th that to help with people with pain? Uh, duloxetine helps people with both types of neuropathic pain. Actually, all three types of pain that aren't nociceptive. There isn't good evidence, is not good evidence to support efficacy of SNRIs, SSRIs, atypicals, tricyclics, all of that for classic nociceptive pain, burns, fractures, that sort of thing. When you're dealing with pain that's come, that comes from a change in the way the nervous system works, some of our psychotropic medications, most notably tricyclics and uh, mood stabilizers, duloxetine, and a few others, uh, then the vaccine, uh, sometimes, and even bupropion. Those medications can temporarily, anyway, change, temporarily sort of pharmacologically reprogram the nervous system so that it runs more in a non-threat mode, but more in a peace mode and isn't processing pain signals aberrantly in the way I was showing you, isn't taking non-painful stimuli and trans transforming them into painful stimuli. So it's useful for all but no susceptive pain is probably the easiest way to say it. And of course, helps often with anxiety and depression. And I'm sorry, there are quite a few more questions, but um, as I understand it, we're going to have an option for a debrief for the folks listening to this coming up in a week and a half or a week away. And um, I want to thank you all for listening. It's a big topic. It covers a lot of ground real fast. Um, and I hope you found it helpful.